from pneumonia in pigs to pyogranulomatous infections of the bovine tongue. Today, we're going to be talking about an important group of veterinary pathogens in the genus Actinobacillus. Actinobacillus is a genus of gram-negative bacteria. Be careful not to confuse these with Actinomyces, a gram-positive genus. These organisms are rods or clocobacilli and are oftentimes pleomorphic. They're facultative anaerobes and are all considered biocontainment level 2. Some species within the genus Actinobacillus are fastidious and can be somewhat difficult to grow, although there are some classic hallmarks of these organisms that can be seen cytologically or histologically from affected tissues, such as the presence of sulfur granules and the characteristic pyogranulomatous inflammation. In this image here, you can see a pure culture of Actinobacillus suis, um, and what's really characteristic of this organism is the Morse code morphology. So the dots and dashes, we have our little coccoid organisms and our rods, all within the same pure culture. In this image here, you can see a sulfur granule, which is formed by clumps of organisms and is really characteristic of Actinobacillus ligniersi infections, which causes wooden tongue in cattle. So here I've outlined two of these sulfur granules. So these large agglomerations of cells, which really stand out quite nicely uh, cytologically. All of these organisms are host associated. Uh, Actinobacillus pleuronemonia, uh, is a contagious infection. So it's something that is readily transmitted from animal to animal, while infections with other species are thought to originate from an animal's endogenous microbiota. So they get infected when they have some sort of breach of their normal defenses, and those organisms that are already present in the body make their way in. The actinobacillus species are found in the upper respiratory tract and mouths of both animals and people, they're also found in the GI tract. And importantly, these organisms really do not survive well in the environment, so they need their host to live. Within the genus Actinobacillus, we have 18 species. We can group these at a very high level uh, by the production of hemolysins. So Actinobacillus pleuronemoniae and suis are both hemolytic species, while Equili and Lichniersi are not hemolytic. Actinobacillus uh, pleuronemoniae can then be differentiated from Actinobacillus suis by its dependency on NAD, which is also known as V factor. And then Equili and Ligniersi can be differentiated based on their fermentation of a number of carbohydrates. So V factor is a nutritional requirement, NAD, but the failure of Actinobacillus pleuronemoniae to produce NAD means that it's dependent on exogenous sources. We can detect this by supplementing uh, a media with V factor. So perhaps putting a, a disc containing NAD on the agar plate and looking for growth surrounding that disc, but not um, outside of its proximity. Or by co-culturing this organism with Staphylococcus aureus, which is known to overproduce this factor. And that's exactly what we can see here. So in this image, what you can see is a cross streak of Staph aureus, these two very nice sort of white lines of bacteria. And this cross streak of Staph aureus has been put onto a plate that has been uh, streaked out with a lawn of what we think might be Actinobacillus pleuronemoniae. And what we're looking for in this case is a phenomenon called satellitism, where our Actinobacillus species will only grow in the presence of our Staphylococcus aureus. So here I've highlighted a number of Actinobacillus colonies with these green arrows that are growing in direct proximity to our Staph aureus streaks, um, but not growing out towards the edges of the plate. So our Staph aureus is producing NAD, it's diffusing through the media, um, and allowing the growth of our Actinobacillus pleuronemoniae in its vicinity. Actinobacillus pleuronemoniae is probably best studied from a virulence perspective. It's known to produce type 4 fimbrae, which are involved in adhesion, capsule, which again is that antiphagocytic sort of force field the bacteria surround themselves with. And in the case of Actinobacillus pleuronemoniae, 
the type of capsule and amount of capsule produced has been demonstrated to impact virulence. So not all strains are equal, and this uh, these differences in, in virulence between strains can be related to the type and amount of capsule formed. They produce cytotoxin, so the APX toxin, uh, which is able to damage porcine neutrophils. And as we'll see in a couple of slides, actinobacillus pleuropneumoniae is a primary, a primary pathogen of pigs. Other species of actinobacillus, such as equili, produce similar toxins, which are toxic to uh, equine granulocytes. They also produce proteases, which allow them to bro break down uh, host cell proteins and facilitates invasion. The four species that we're going to discuss today are Actinobacillus pleuropneumoniae, which in pigs causes pleuropneumonia, Actinobacillus suis, which in pigs also causes pleuropneumonia, a syndrome quite similar to Actinobacillus pleuropneumoniae. It also causes septicemia in young piglets, meningitis, and abortion, Actinobacillus ligniersi, which causes wooden tongue in cattle, and Actinobacillus equili, which causes sepsis in neonatal foals and primarily respiratory tract infections in adult horses. Actinobacillus pleuropneumoniae is a little bit of a mouthful, and so it's commonly abbreviated APP. APP causes a very important economically damaging disease. This organism is spread between pigs through droplets, and it requires quite close contact between animals uh, for transmission to occur. Chronically infected animals or subclinical carriers maintain the organism within the herd. When we have disease in one of these animals, so if we have uh, any inflammation, that stimulates coughing, which leads to the spread of the organism, and subsequent infection of penmates. There's a variable incubation period associated with this organism, and we tend to see uh, outbreaks in two to four month old piglets, which we assume is due to waning maternal immunity. The disease presentation does vary with age, the herd health state, and environmental conditions, so all of those aspects of the epidemiological triad that we've talked about previously. One of the syndromes that's recognized is a per-acute disease. These are very, very sick animals who rapidly deteriorate. You'll see high fever, possibly diarrhea and vomiting. In their respiratory system, we have a fibrinous or necrotizing pneumonia and fibrinous pleuritis. Um, the animals are in respiratory distress, which is rapidly followed by circulatory collapse. Animals become cyanotic as the uh, circulatory system breaks down. They display mouth breathing, um, and then they die. Death can occur very quickly in as little as four hours, but up to 36 in per acute presentations. On the right here, you can see the lungs of an infected animal, and I think you can appreciate this very severe necrohemorrhagic pleuropneumonia. So these lung lobes here, you can see they're very congested, there's a lot of blood, a lot of inflammation, and the cirrhosal surface of the lungs is coated in fibrin. So this almost scrambled egg-looking um, appearance to the cirrhosal surface indicates all the deposition of that protein and a very um, highly inflammatory, rapidly progressing disease. In acute disease, we see uh, a clinical manifestation that tends to be more widespread in the barn. These animals are inappetent and potentially won't drink. They have respiratory signs, including cough and open mouth breathing. Ultimately, they may also progress to respiratory and circulatory failure, although a spectrum of outcomes can be seen within the herd. So from recovery all the way through to death, just depending on the immune state of the individual animal. On the right here, you can see acute hemorrhagic and fibrinous pneumonia. So whereas on the previous uh, section, we were looking at the cirrhosal surface, here we see a cut section of the lungs. Mm -hmm. Here, I think you can see just how much blood is present within the lung itself. And finally, chronic disease is what we think of occurring after the acute signs uh, resolve or potentially in animals who have a, a more smoldering disease that doesn't necessarily have that acute phase. We see lethargy and exercise intolerance, which if you think about the pathology associated with these organisms, a fibrinous pneumonia affecting the lungs, probably affecting 
uh, the capacity of the lungs to uh, efficiently exchange oxygen. Um, we see decreased production in these animals, so uh, poor feed conversion and poor weight gain, even in those animals treated with antibiotics. In this image on the right here, you can see again sort of an acute fibrinous pleuropneumonia um, and pericarditis that's associated with, in this case, a mixed infection with APP and also pastorella, which we'll talk about in a future lecture. What I want you to appreciate here is sort of the dull and roughened appearance of the pleura and serosal surface of the lungs, and then also that we have some sort of deflated uh, lung lobes, so it doesn't look like there's a lot of air up in this anterior section. In this cytology prep, you can see APP organisms um, on fluids collected from the lung, so all these uh, rods here in, in this cellular background. Dealing with APP in pig production systems can be quite challenging. Um, chronic and subclinical infections can be a persistent problem and lead to ongoing transmission within a production facility. Management strategies to uh, prevent the introduction of, of new carriers can be really important. So uh, management strategies like all in, all out, ensuring that replacement stock is bought from specific, specific pathogen free herds, if at all possible, um, can also be useful. And of course, the typical strategies, maintaining a healthy herd, reducing the burden of other illnesses that will immunosuppress the pigs and result in a more serious infection if they do develop the disease. So preventing influenza infections and vaccinating them for other pathogens as well. It's important to know that we can see a clinically similar syndrome with actinobacillus suis, although in these cases, we typically also have other body sites involved. So they're generally septic, we may see meningitis or abortion in addition to respiratory signs. Mm -hmm.